Audible is my, my road trip companion. It's kind of my quiet alone time. Audible is a, is a routine for me. It's like a fun night school for adults. I could easily be seduced into locking myself in a place where I do nothing but listen to books. <laughs> I never was interested in historical fiction before, but I'm obsessed with it now. There are a lot of like classic and big titles that I, I feel like I've missed out. Since I don't have time to read, I might as well listen. If I want to catch up on the news or history or learn what's going on in the world, I can download a book and listen to it. Because I listened to her story over and over again, I made the decision to go ahead and follow my own dream, which was to help other veterans. I think there's like 180 books in my, in my library now. It changes your perspective. It makes you a different person. It's true. It's so true. <laughs> Download Audible and start listening today. director. Oh, oh sure. Uh, hello again. I guess we had a, a little bit of a technical problem. I'm Michael Ordonia. I cover film, television, and pop culture for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, thanks for tuning in to the 25th Annual Festival of Books and our virtual event with Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver, the co-authors of the Alien Superstar series. Today, they'll be discussing and reading from their second book in the series, Lights, Camera, Danger. I hope I held up the right book. <laughs> Yay! Um, about the authors, Lynn Oliver is a writer and producer and the executive director of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Henry Winkler, you may recognize, he's an Emmy-winning actor, and he's also a comedian, director, producer, and fly fisherman. Before we bring them in, uh, we just wanted to encourage you to support your local independent bookstores during the festival. As you might imagine, they've been hit pretty hard during the pandemic and we need them, so please do. Um, signed copies of Henry and Lynn's book, this one, are available from our bookselling partner, Mrs. Nelson's Book Company. The link is at events.latimes.com slash festival of books. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver. Yay! <laughs> Hi, Henry. Hi, Lynn. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Good Michael. morning. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, before we uh, let you guys read and, and chat about the book, uh, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the genesis of the series. Um, you two worked together on the Hank Zipser series, which, of course, was uh, inspired by Henry's experience with dyslexia. Um, for Alien Superstar, oh, I should mention, by the way, that Hank Zipper, Zipser series for the uninitiated, it sold more than 3 million copies. Um, so for Alien Superstar, we know that Henry came from far away to become a star in Hollywood, but uh, uh, the other similarities are not so clear. Uh, I detect in the books a very strong love of science, especially astronomy. And uh, there are themes of looking beneath the surface of people to see who they really are and uh, maybe even an immigration-related uh, message of tolerance. Am I, uh, am I on the right track, guys? You're, you're entirely in, uh, on the right track. Um, uh, really, what, what the underlying theme is about, the book is a comedy, as are all of our books, but the underlying theme is that under, even though we're all different underneath our external differences, we're all the same. So, um, so this alien who comes from an, uh, from a strange land has a lot to learn about living here on Earth, but we have a lot to learn from him as well about how to uh, appreciate everybody's differences. Henry, did you want to add to that? No, I just totally agree. What what I realized was that Lynn and I, in all of the books, we've written thirty five novels together, which is I can't even comprehend. But in each one of them, our characters are always on the outside looking in. They always feel just that tiny bit estranged 
from what's going on. And, and they want to be on the other side of the glass, you know? And um, so many children feel that because of a, a physical challenge, a mental challenge, a, an athletic challenge, uh, the way that they feel they look challenge. So uh, we always incorporate uh, that point of view. Hmm. Um, these, that certainly comes through in the book, that, that point of view and that concern comes through in, in both books. Um, particularly, actually, at the end of the second one, without spoiling anything, how some people are starting to come to, together as a, uh, a, a team. Um, yes. So, uh, look, I didn't want to get in the way of, of uh, what you had in mind. I know that you had uh, a section of the book that, that you wanted to read to our our uh, viewers, is there something you'd like to say to set it up? Uh, some background you'd like to give for people who don't who don't know the story of the Alien Superstar? Okay, so our alien has six eyes that rotate around his head. He's blue, cobalt blue, because we thought that was a beautiful color, and and his blood is purple because we thought it went so well with cobalt blue. He also has a uh, an appendage which is a, um, uh, a a sensory enhancer and on his planet when he's 13 it's cut off so that everybody just feels exactly the same thing no one has a point of view so he lands on earth the only address he knows it's the back lot of universal studios he meets Luis Ramirez his first and really good friend who also works at Universal our alien needs to be hydrated at least an hour a day. So Luis sees that he is low in energy and throws him in the Jurassic Park ride lake. He sinks to the bottom. Before I could swim away, a large brontosaurus head with its mouth open splashed through the surface of the lake heading directly for me. And there was no doubt that that head belonged to that three-clawed foot staring me in the face. It picked me up and grabbed me by its teeth and lifted me out of the water at least 50 feet and swung me around like a feather. I yelled to Luis, help me, help me, I'm being eaten. Luis said, hey, don't, don't worry about it, dude. It's okay because the brontosaurus is a plant eater. He's not real. But he is real enough for me to be 50 feet in the air. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed hold of one of the nostril hairs, the nose hairs in the brontosaurus's nose. I then was able to lift myself onto his tongue, which was very spongy. And then I lifted myself onto his head. And the only way down was to slide down the brontosaurus's back. But it was 50 feet in the air. Oh my goodness. I don't know what to do. Send in a, hel a helicopter there, Luis. I'm stuck. Slide. Don't worry about it. Have fun. I looked down, and then I just got all of my courage together, and... My gosh. What happens next? What happens next? Please tell us. Well... Television veteran. Leave us a little cliffhanger. <laughs> I always like cliffhangers. <laughs> yeah, uh, this uh, this book is certainly more uh, action packed than the, the first one. There's a lot a lot going on. The you know the big uh, big chase that I well, want. Th this book like this that. book is uh, you know his planet doesn't like the fact that he escaped. If one person escapes, maybe everyone will. So they send Citizen Cruel the worst of the worst shapeshifters, and they send her down to Earth to kidnap our buddy Burger, our hero, our alien, and take him back. But his friends, the star of the show, uh, uh, Cassidy, Cambridge, and uh, the uh, Luis, his other friend, help thwart the plan. <laughs> Lynn, is this what your collaboration is like a lot? Uh, uh, you guys work together and, and Henry uh, kind of acts out the scenes? Uh, well, you know, we both came. I, I started as a television writer and, and Henry has spent a, a, a moment or two on, on sound stages. So we're both very used to a collaborative process 
where, as you do in television, where you work together, where you work in a writer's room. So our, when we work together, my little office is like our writer's room. So yeah, I'm at the computer and Henry is across from me and, and he has an idea and I write and then I have an idea and he listens. And then we, he, Henry likes to say we argue over every word. I think, I think it's lively debate, but <laughs> in any case, yeah, we, so it is kind you of know, what it's at like. the end of a debate, Lynn, Lynn always yeah. said after we argue, he said, Henry, you have driven me to drink. <laughs> and then I have a diet peach <laughs> snapple. <laughs> That's my idea of a, of a stiff drink. <laughs> uh, so the, as I was saying earlier, that there's really a strong thread of uh, science in the story, not just because of science fiction, but because you guys are, uh, you've thrown in a, a bunch of science facts. Um, where where does that come from? Are you both big uh, science nerds like me? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I think that our that our readers are. You know, I think kids are really fascinated with with space, and kids know about astronomy. I mean, I have three children, and I think you know, very soon after they could talk, they could tell you how far away Earth was from the Moon. You know, I think this is a natural subject of interest. So we're very careful to to research our facts and make sure that that. Where, that we're getting it right. And the book is definitely science fiction. As far as I know, neither one of us has actually met an alien. I don't know. Henry, have you? I don't no, think I have. No, I have but... not. Uh, here is a picture, if you can see, of Citizen Cruel, and mm. she is the worst of the worst. She is a toughie. But I, I have often thought, and, I, and I've said it before, but... It was a full-blown thought in my head. I didn't muse about it. I didn't think about it. I didn't wonder. An alien is going to land on our planet, and they are going to land in my vicinity, in my backyard, and they are going to be friendly. I have been convinced of that since I was a little boy. Mm. Um, well, that that's so. That was the the nut of this story. That you thought, what if an alien lands and it's friendly and it really kind of wants to be like us? Well, I, I must say, we understood Hollywood. We understand children's fascination with wanting to be a star and paparazzi and uh, you know all, what they think is the glamour. Mm -hmm. And Lynn and I, having spent a long time creating television. We understood the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we we think it is really Im important to tell the truth, even mm -hmm. in the science facts, because children can smell when you're making it up just to make it up. Hmm. We base everything in authenticity. Uh, well, you two have been around a lot of television. You're you're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you do depict some pretty crazy Hollywood behavior in the in the books. I'm going to just go out on a limb and say some of that is uh, based on actual events. Absolutely. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, the show that that, uh, that our alien buddy Berger stars in is called Oddball Academy, and it's shot on the back lot at Universal, and it's shot on stage 42, which is where I, I executive produced a show called Harry the Hendersons, that was on stage 42 on the back lot at Universal. So it, it really it really helps in terms of authenticity to have had the experience. You know, they say you write what you know. Although as far as I know, we, were, we weren't actually writing about an alien visiting there. But, you know, when you spend a lot of time on a soundstage, you have a lot of alien kind of experiences, wouldn't you say, Henry? <laughs> you know what, it, it is honestly true. Uh, to be in Hollywood, uh, if, uh, if young people are watching this and they, you want to be an actor, I think it is important to study, to train your, yourself, to learn technique. Like, I had to learn the writing uh, for children, the writing and general technique, which, and, and I went to the master, Lynn Oliver. She was my teacher about all the rules of actually writing in the first person, the second person, the third person. You can't go in between each. You've got to stay, <laughs> even if you feel stuck. Oh, I, I'm telling you, it was amazing. Go out the door you came in. 
<laughs> you're telling everybody my secrets. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what I and what I learned from Henry when we were working on this book was all the experiences that he had behind the scenes as an actor. You know, w working with other actors, um, learning your lines, uh, blowing your lines during uh, you know during a filming, working with the other actors cooperatively, figuring out who gets who gets what what starring moment, you know, so that, so hopefully there's a lot of that behind the scenes experience that that's sort of the foundation of this book. And we love that because we think all of us are attracted by the notion of celebrity and, and uh, by the dream of sort of being the star of your own show and especially kids. And especially these days when everybody is a celebrity, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take that much. It, it's a, it's a good thing to have a look at what celebrity is and the benefits of it, and also the costs of it. The cost uh, is very important, that our characters learn uh, that it's not just all fun and games, that there is a great responsibility to yourself and to each other. Uh, that is very important to us. Because as in every field, there are people who are idiots who are going to make your life miserable. And you have to be strong enough. You have to learn to be strong enough to negotiate all of that. It's like uh, the, that wonderful Tai Chi, which I learned in drama class. Uh, uh, bad stuff is coming at you. You move to the side. It goes by. You come back to center. And you keep going where you need to go. Hmm. Uh uh, you said something really interesting that I want to follow up on, Lynn, uh, but I should explain to the uninitiated, if there's anyone watching this who hasn't read the books, um, Buddy, yeah, he's from another planet, <clears throat> lands on on uh, uh, lands in a lot of Universal Studios, and ends up being the star of a, a, a sitcom that's uh, <clears throat> already popular, but maybe flagging a little bit. But uh, the, the books so far are about how he becomes uh, very close with some of the people he meets there and how, the, how his plan wants to come back. Just want to be clear about that for anybody who hasn't read them. But uh, Lynn, you were talking Thank about you. how you learned some stuff uh, uh, from Henry about um, his experiences, but you've been, uh, you've been on sound stages yourself. So I, I was kind of surprised to hear that uh, there was so much he had to tell you about it that was new. What's an example of something that what? Henry told you that you wanted to put in the book? Well, for example, so I've been on sound stages, but as an executive producer and as a writer, never as an actor. I have there's nothing about me that is a performer. So, for instance, uh, Buddy has a relationship. There's there there is sort of a hunky star of the show uh, named Tyler, and Tyler. And when Buddy comes in and suddenly captures the heart and soul of the audience, Tyler does not have a good reaction to that because he had been the sort of heartthrob star. And so that that interaction between uh, somebody who was supposed to be the star and someone who comes in and becomes the star, I don't know if you remember uh, how Happy Days began, but I think when the Fonz was first cast, he was not the star of the show, but rapidly he sort of broke out. So what that relationship is, is like when you're the breakup buddy is essentially like the Fonz. He's the breakout star of the show. And that creates, you have to learn how to negotiate that. There's one scene in the book where Buddy is supposed to meet Cassidy, the, his co-star, because she's she's uh, having a debut at a club. She's singing for the right. first time. But instead of meeting her, he gets taken out to dinner by the president of the network. And he gets so entranced by that that he stands up his friend and he's not there for his friend. So that's an example of having to learn how to negotiate your fame, and you you know you still you still are the same person, and you still have the same friends, and you still have the same human obligations. But Buddy gets a little bit carried away with his sudden celebrity. So those kinds those kinds of experiences where that Henry had, where it's like to be an actor, but suddenly be confronted with enormous fame. And Henry is such a sweet lovely, kind, humble person. He doesn't talk about that. But I know that he was the first person ever to appear on the cover of People magazine. But you wouldn't know that from 
from talking to him. He's, he's, you've never actually mentioned that to me, Henry, but I did my research. I know that. And so those kinds of things of what, what it's like to be suddenly very, very famous and very revered and how that affects your, your essential humanity is really something that I watched Henry navigate and, and appreciate in so much in how he does it. And our character Buddy has to learn the same thing. He has to learn to be humble in the midst of huge celebrity. Acting is not just being on the set. It's not just working in front of the camera. It's not just making appearances. It really is negotiating the humanness of everybody that you're working with. It is negotiating what the public thinks about who you are and who you really are. When I became um, uh, famous, when I became a celebrity because of the Fonz on Happy Days, I got 50,000 letters a week. What I didn't do, I didn't get any smarter. I was still dyslexic. I was still short. I hadn't, I hadn't grown one inch. So what uh, the stardom and I'm still the same and maybe I better look at the correlation between those two. Hmm. It is funny to think of it, uh, the way you put it, Lynn, and, and you expanded Henry, <clears throat> it, to remember that when Happy Days started, it, it, you know, Fonz was a minor character. And then you know, I had six lines. <laughs> In the, in the first episode, you had six lines? Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it didn't end up that way. <clears throat> um, so uh, speaking of, uh, just a little bit more of that, the partnership that you two have. Um, uh, I was asking Lynn about some of the things that you, that you brought Henry to it. Uh, can you name one or two of your favorite things that Lynn brought to this specific book? One or two oh things that she with, brought in. Oh, I love it. I got to have that. Without a doubt, uh, what I what I from the very very beginning, what I have learned. First of all, Lynn is um, a much more structured than I am. Uh, I am more improvisational, but Lynn needs an outline. She thinks it's very important that we have an outline, and mm -hmm. so we are very careful to work out beat by beat every chapter of the book. And then what we find is as we're writing it, the book has a mind of its own. And all of a sudden, it takes a left turn. And we have learned to go left with it. And then that changes our outline. But we have a real vision of where we're starting and where we want to end up. So that's number one. Number two, Lynn is obsessed with a title. Because it is true that a child goes into a bookstore or before the pandemic and you have three seconds or three and a half seconds for the child to take the book off the shelf, look at the cover and decide, oh, I'm taking that home or oh, I'm putting it back. So we spend hours working on titles and then eventually call it down to the list of three and send that to the publisher and then one of those three um becomes our title for all of the 35 books that we've written uh so in response to the question it's really the 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 discipline and structure that um that you feel really shaped uh these books and, and it sounds like your experience as a writer for That's me, what, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Even as an actor, it's really important. You have to focus. You have got to keep your eye on the ball. You've got to remember where all of your characters, as you're writing them, where they've been. Do they have three stomachs or two mm -hmm. stomachs? Uh, <laughs> how many tongues? Uh, <laughs> what? Wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't do that because she just said on page 24 that she doesn't like toast, and now all of a sudden she's making toast for breakfast. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you've got to keep, you've got to keep 
everything um, at the forefront of your brain as you're writing away, having a great time. Uh, you know, Henry always says, before we start writing every day, we talk about our lives and, and our children and our families. And one of the things I always hear him say about raising children, we each have three children, separately, of course, not, not together, <laughs> is that in structure, there is freedom. Yes. So that so as we talk about raising our children, we say if you set up rules, it gives them the, the the freedom to explore life. And it's really the same thing in writing. You know, we set up a structure so that we have a, a, a foundation, you know, a skeleton of where we're going. And then that gives you the freedom to to follow your instinct. If you just set out to write and you think, here's an idea, let's see where it goes. It doesn't. You don't really have the same freedom because you're you're anxious about it. This way, if you have a arbiter, if you have a, a you know a structure, you're you're kind of free to then explore scene by scene where it goes. So Henry, you know, I'm will, quoting you uh, in in structure there is freedom, right? Yes, uh, and I was just going to say that in a completely other discipline, the idea is there there is a ballet. It's called Swan Lake. Many, many, many ballerinas, many prima ballerinas have danced the swan. The, the, the steps are absolutely rigid. They are absolutely written down. Uh, you do not deviate from the steps that were created in the beginning of the ballet. But each ballerina has another life that they push into the structure of the steps. And that's why one ballerina is so different or is so magnificent as that swan as, a, as compared to another. In structure comes freedom. Yeah, I, I agree quite. I think when there's uh, no structure, you, the, the work tends to get lost. It, uh, yes, right. right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of like having a, a hose and the, the water just sort of pouring out of the hose instead of being focused in uh, focused in one direction. Um, right. uh, I, just, I just want to ask one more question for um, to for the folks who, again, don't know the series so well. Um, one of Buddy's uh, characteristics, one of his main characteristics, characteristics is that he's uh, extremely literal because he doesn't understand all of uh, the human vernacular. So um, where did that come from? What are your, your favorite bits of, of Buddy being hyper-literal? So Buddy, Buddy has, uh, he has the capability. Here's how Buddy reads. He takes a book and he puts it up to his head. And in about three seconds, he's learned the entire book. So he has a photographic memory and implanted in his brain is an English dictionary at the source. So he knows all the literal interpretations of words, but he doesn't know the idioms. So for instance, if he comes into a restaurant and, and the maitre d' says, can I get you a table? He says, "No, I don't. I already, no, I already have a table. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to sit down and eat." So everything that we use as an idiom is is for him a little literal interpretation. So a lot of the humor, uh, a lot of the humor of the book comes from that. Comes from him hearing something, thinking that that it, it that it is what it means, and not understanding how we use things colloquially. Um, I think that I think we're running out of time, so I should uh, probably ask you a couple of questions that the audience has um, uh, thrown out here. Uh, Annette asks, "How many hours a day do you write, and how consistent is your schedule when you're writing?" Now, you've talked about this a little bit. All right, when we are writing a book, I leave my house, I drive to Lynn's uh, office uh, since 2003. Uh, we, I get there at uh, between 10, 10, 15, depending on uh, if I've stopped for pastry. Uh, <laughs> we talk until about 11, 15, and then we write until 12, 31 o'clock. Every day when there oh. is a book due. That, that's bet, extremely I'll, consistent. I'll bet that Annette is, is a writer or someone who is... who an aspiring writer, because that's the first question that people always ask. You know, you think, do you have to sit in front of your computer and write eight hours a day? 
And what you have to do is you have to work every day and you have to be committed to adding a little bit to your story every day. But you also have to allow time for inspiration and for life and to experience things to write about. So Mm -hmm. we try to do that. You know, we write during our prime time when we're both excited to be writing. And then when we start to wane, which is usually sort of around the time for a tuna fish sandwich, uh, we (laughs) stop because you 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 get the you get the best of what you have to offer, and then you need to sort of uh, treat the rest of yourself and come back at it again the next day. So I think consistency is the most important thing, rather than the the length of time that you're that you're trying to force yourself to write. You know what? That also works. That exact rule in parenting. It's oh. not the length of the time; it is the quality of the time you spend with that child. With your child. So I throw that in. Uh, good answers. Okay, Bob. Uh, Bob asks, what made you decide to write children's books? And do you enjoy the writing experience? I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I was having a <laughs> lull in my acting career. Alan Berger, a, a wonderful agent uh, in, in this industry, said, write books for children about your dyslexia. I said, I am dyslexic. I believe I am as stupid as everybody told me I was. No. He said, I'll introduce you to Lynn. We had lunch. The fish I had was horrible, but the <laughs> meat was great. And we hatched Hank Zipser. And for me, I write what I know. It is easy for me to remember what it is to be an eight or nine or 10 year old failing at everything, oh. sharpening my pencils, being organized, but my brain was not. Oh, that's kind of uh, painful to hear. Um, but the experience of writing the children's books, though, I, I would imagine that the feedback you've had has been rewarding, right? <gasps> Okay, so I'll just say, uh, I mean, where, you know, I speak publicly around the country sometimes when you could fly. And uh, I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, a wonderful, uh, just outside of Bird of Paradise, Pennsylvania. And uh, we pulled up to the hotel and a young man, the bellman, came flying out from behind his desk, I thought, to take um, Stacy, my wife's uh, bag. He said, I'm 23 years old. I read every Hank Zipser. You really got me through school. Oh. Holy moly moly. That I mean, come on. And and that is a microcosm of what Lynn and I experience. Uh, you know, especially, especially because our first books were about uh, a kid with a learning challenge. One in five children in America has some kind of learning challenge. And so their parents are so grateful when they find a book that they want to read, that they like to read. So many parents have said to us, I was walking by my child's room and they were, I heard them laughing and I stuck my head in and they were reading a book. And they're so emotional about the fact that, that their kid wanted to read a book, was finding pleasure in a book and, and not having to wrestle, you know, in trying to make them read. So mm-hmm. that to us is a huge, uh, it's a huge motivating factor. Our books are first and foremost funny, and and we want them to be the book that kids go to. That no one has to say, "I'm going to pay you a penny a page to finish this book," or you know that oh. this, it, you know, <laughs> we all we all did that with our kids. <laughs> that's yeah. that's two fifty for your book. Whoa. <laughs> That's exactly right. And and we all we all have done that with our kids. So we want to be the book that, that the kid says, you, we're not forcing you to read a chapter a night. You're reading the next chapter because you want to know what happens and because you're having fun with it and you relate to that character. And so that's why we write. There are other writers who write uh, great sort of literary masterpieces. Our motivation is to write a really relatable, fun, compelling story that makes reading pleasurable for kids. Right. We we did not start off, nor did we ever think about self-help or, oh, wow, this is really going to help those kids. We mm-hmm. only thought about if, if Lynn and I do not laugh during a writing session, it does mm-hmm. not go in. <laughs> and then we take full responsibility for that we think it's funny. 
uh, I have twins, and um, one of my oh. favorite, uh, they're, they're 12. Oh, um, my goodness. <laughs> one of my favorite uh, things they do is I need a page. <laughs> one of my favorite things they'll do is uh, debate about books. Like, this character was doing, no, nah, that character's the worst piece of this. Uh, it shows how engaged they are and how they get into it. I'll let tell you right now, they're, they're debating about 1984. Um, oh, my goodness. I remember so, uh, 12 and reading that. Yeah, it's pretty rough, but a great, great book for anybody to read. Uh, Anne, not, not small children, please. <clears throat> Anne asks, how and when did you guys become writing par partners? Which is a good question. I mean, uh, you've both been around television for a long time, but how did you meet? How did you decide that you, you were the right people to work together? Well, Annie, first of all, a happy Sunday. Uh, Lynn and I met uh, because, as I said, because of um, my agent at the time, Alan Berger. Uh, and we have been writing since 2003. And since 2003, we have written 35 books together. And at the end of the session, and this happens every time, I walk into Lynn's office and there is a blank screen. I walk out of Lynn's office and she has printed six to eight pages that did not exist before. Wow. I am blown away every time. Mm -hmm. The thing that's so interesting about that is when we first started, Henry said, I don't think I can do this. I'm not sure I can write a book. You know, reading was hard for him. And so the idea of writing was was pretty overwhelming. But he said, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try. And what, what he discovered is there that you may not take a traditional path to getting something done, but you there is a path to getting something done if you really want to do it. So mm -hmm. we found a way to work together that enables him to be a full participant and me to be a full participant. So it's really being open. And this is a great message for kids who might be watching this too, that you do, you have to try to, whatever it is you want to do. If you try, you could find a way. And there are many roads that lead to a solution. You don't have to do it just one way. That's a great right. message for teachers too, in, yeah. for, in thinking about their students. Students have all kinds of different capabilities. And the, the job of a teacher, the job of a parent, is to help kids find the route to get to what they want to do, to, to find the path, which is probably different for each person. So I really sort of commend Henry in, in being at first kind of overwhelmed with the concept of writing a book. Is that fair, Henry? I don't I don't wanna yes. I don't wanna misrepresent. No, but, but finding you know a way to do it. The the same thing happened when I was doing happy days, uh, I started to produce and when the first thing I ever produced was MacGyver. And I said, I cannot produce, I can't, I don't know business, I don't understand how to do that job. And my lawyer at the time said, you will learn, just try. And you find out that exactly what Lynn said, which is vital, there is only your way. There is not a way. There is your way if you are willing to try. Hmm. Uh, all right, guys, I'm afraid we have gone way over time because you guys have had so many great answers. Um, uh, thank you really for, for taking the time to sit with us uh, uh, in this virtual event. Um, everyone watching, I want to remind you that uh, Mrs. Nelson's book company has signed copies of Alien Superstar, the Lights, Camera, Danger. Woohoo! Um, links are at events.latimes.com slash festival of books. Thank you all so much for coming and special thanks to our guests, Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver. Can I say one Thank thing, you. Michael? Please, please. Mrs. Nelson has been there for us since the beginning. Oh, we absolutely. have gone there to the store and signed in the store since the beginning of our writing together. So Mrs. Nelson, thank you once again for supporting us. Absolutely. And we love independent bookstores and we encourage everyone who's watching to support indie bookstores. As you said, they're having a rough time and they need all of our help. We would hate to lose independent bookstores in our society. 
Yeah. So anyway, thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure talking to you, Henry. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, have a good one, everybody. Stay safe and vote. Okay. Stay, vote, and vote, stay vote. healthy. Vote. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.